please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Americans don't trust their institutions. What has happened? And what does such a lack of trust in institutions do to an electorate? One of the things that I think is most troubling about American politics today is the reemergence of a white identity that is voting almost in lockstep as if it is a minority group. What we're seeing is a new kind of sectarianism, though, which is organized around places that are doing very poorly in a global context. And the idea of isolation matters a lot there. Donald Trump appealed to a certain population and made them feel that now that in the absence of industrial work uh, and the rise of technology and in the uh, proliferation, we can say, of more and more people of color in America, I'm your guy, I'm gonna take you back to those good old days. The United States of America is at an historic crossroads. A divisive president leads a divided nation, bringing a promise of hope for some and alarm for others. The American people face an uncertain future, the roots of which lie in the country's unsettled past. In 1945, the U.S. emerged from World War II with new optimism as the new world power. 17 million new jobs, a hike in industrial productivity, and doubling of corporate profits would mean the American dream was going mainstream. It would be driven by a new ideology, consumption. The premise of the post-war industrial America is that the growth that we used to get by conquering other nations and enslaving their people and extracting their minerals, now we'd be able to get that growth internally through consumption. So we build the suburbs because if everyone's living in their own house, everyone's gonna need their own dishwasher, their own washing machine, their own lawnmower, their own car, their own thing. This is an explicit policy of the Roosevelt administration to get people buying things again. The government started guaranteeing home mortgages, and uh, as soon as people had money available, they started buying homes in droves. The easiest place to trace all this back to are some of the very well-meaning reforms of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. FDR came up with the idea that we're gonna make sure everybody has a job and a mortgage and a home and they kind of developed an idea for a society where men would be kept apart from one another in these little homes in suburban uh, tract areas like Levittown. You have troops coming back at the end of World War II in 1945 who have to be integrated into the economy. And there are social programs, including the GI Bill, by which American workers and a professional class can enjoy a standard of living 
that is probably unequaled anywhere else in the industrialized world. This is affirmative action for whites. This bill, the GI Bill, allows returning servicemen to purchase homes in the suburbs to get education. So this, this, this policy essentially facilitates that dream by you know, making, making the suburbs possible, the, the kind of white picket fence, um, crabgrass, you know, two kids and a dog and a playground kind of life that we see as the kind of aesthetic of the American dream. At the end of World War II, you find that black people maintain that we're in the same status we were in since 1865. The so-called middle class was being uh, developed, uh, but um, there was no such thing uh, for black people. The American dream was becoming a reality for growing numbers of U.S. citizens, primarily those who weren't black or women. It was not an inclusive dream. The women gained, but in a particular way, through, through a man's income. The 50s were the period of really strong domesticity in this country in which married women's labor force participation was quite low. So women were having lots of kids. They were marrying early. They were more likely to be uh, at home in those suburbs. As the transformative 1950s drew to a close, the new decade would give voice to those with a different vision of America and a different version of the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. You get these major demonstrations, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963 being kind of inspiring to other marginalized groups, women, gays, and to a new generation of youth who want to kind of create a different kind of American society and see the 1960s as an opportunity to do so. Here is this great so-called land of the free home of the brave that is denying the most fundamental citizens' rights to a certain group of people. People saw now that people st wanting to sit in, at, go to a restaurant and sit there and have a root beer or something really quite small and irrelevant, um, were being uh, hosed down by the sheriffs. Um, they were being um, bitten by dogs and uh, trying to desegregate certain schools. The struggle for equality would lead to the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act being signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson. These two victories bookended one of America's most painful presidential elections. The era of civil rights showed a nation facing up to its divisions, but at the same time pushing some of its people even further apart. What you're seeing starting in the 1960s is that the Ameri white American worker is no longer the privileged citizen. So the reaction comes from that group, which had basically been equated with America um, for much of American history, all of a sudden now feeling like they weren't any longer at the center of American political interest and political discussion. The 1964 election would see President Johnson claim an overwhelming victory, winning 44 out of 50 states against his Republican rival, Barry Goldwater. But Goldwater's six states included five in the Deep South, states that had never, in the post-Civil War era, gone to a Republican candidate. And it was down to one overriding issue, race. Goldwater runs a campaign focused on states' rights. It's a campaign focused on what are the be already the churnings of the civil rights movement and growing unrest in American streets and racial conflict of a sort that we hadn't seen so openly in several decades. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. 
And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. He was personally not a racist, not in favor of segregation, but he opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 because he said the Constitution didn't allow forcing businesses to uh, not to discriminate. When the head of the Ku Klux Klan, when all these weird groups come out in favor of the candidate of my party, either they're not Republicans or I'm not. Goldwater uh, is routed in the 1964 elections. It's one of the biggest landslides of all time. But Goldwater establishes a beachhead. He wins several southern states from the old Confederacy. And so he establishes a new foothold for Republicans. And so there is, at the popular level, the beginnings of mass discontent among Southern Democrats with the Democratic Party because it is becoming a racially tolerant and a pro-civil rights party. President Johnson would go on to pursue his vision of the Great Society with a so-called war on poverty that had a limited impact on helping America's poor. With law and order under threat from rising tensions between African Americans whose rights were now legally enshrined and the authorities still coming to terms with those rights, the Johnson administration's response was to shift from a war on poverty to a war on crime. We get the beginnings of a militarized police. We get the beginnings of new tactical units that the federal government is also funding that will patrol troublesome neighborhoods, so black, low-income black urban neighborhoods in new ways where the more police we get on the streets, the more we can make arrests, the more we can remove troubled people, potential delinquents from their communities, and this will lead to greater public safety. In St. Louis, a civil rights rally crumbled quickly into riot. Talk of a white backlash became widespread. The worst race riots since those two years ago in the Watt section of Los Angeles rocked New Jersey's largest city, Newark, for five consecutive days and nights. Lyndon B. Johnson's presidency would be tainted by a paradox. The president who signed through the Civil Rights Act would also implement strict law and order legislation that served against the very people the act meant to protect. America was riven by competing ideals and politics. Protests against the ongoing war in Vietnam remained strong. A movement for greater equality for women was gathering momentum and the struggle against racial discrimination took new form and new power. There's a civil rights movement, there's new groups asserting their voices and becoming empowered in new ways, but there's not a fundamental structural transformation that occurs in that period to really, to really realize that principle of equality. The protests of the 60s outside of the civil rights movement was largely run by middle-class white college kids. Who, who were seen as elitist and who eventually could be bought off by being given, at that time, employment within the state that could create a middle-class lifestyle. The age of equality was in a faltering, experimental phase. But the people threatened by the demands of those seeking parity remained key constituents for U.S. policymakers. The 1968 presidential elections would see the Republican Party once again play politics with the North-South divide and play up to the prejudices that still held sway in much of America. The man who would benefit from a Southern strategy that appealed to white conservatives was Richard Nixon. We want to bridge the gap between the races. We want to bring the America together. But the 60s, given that that's the time that the Southern strategy was put forward, that was the dawn of identity politics in America. Can we say that? Is it fair to say that? I mean, in some way, race has always been the master category of American politics. That's identity politics. I mean, it's also status and class politics. It's the way we define status. It's the way we define good and bad. 
It's the way we define worthy and unworthy. Um, and that's what I mean by master category. It's a cultural master category that organizes the way that, um, that people in the United States think. And that is a legacy of the country's history um, that we energetically reproduce often whenever, and whenever we get the chance. Um, so, you know, we were talking about race as a wedge issue in 1968. Race has always been a wedge issue in the United States. It was a wedge issue in the Civil War. Um, um, it's, it's always been a wedge issue. Um, it's the ultimate wedge issue. It's how, it's how employers manage to get white workers to take less money because um, they would deliver them status, the status of being a white person. What you saw in 1968 was, um, was something new in the sense of political strategy. Um, you, what you're seeing is a more precise targeting of demographic groups and figuring out issues to leverage them rather than, for example, organizing around principles of solidarity, which had been how parties had operated for a while, at least since the New Deal. Well, but white voters in the South always voted Democratic uh, or voted for Democrats back in the day, not that long ago. Uh, but we also called the Democrats Dixiecrats. Uh, back in the days of uh, overt Jim Crow, overt Jim Crow. But white people have never been concerned about black people's issues or anything else anyway. The whole union uh, question, going back to the turn of the last century, um, where you had uh, unions specifically denying uh, black people jobs, where uh, industrial jobs, you know, in the steel mills and so forth and so on. So um, the racism within the unions and so forth, nobody paid attention to any of this stuff. Everybody was living in Levittown, the university, you know, the universe of Levittown. I've got a job, Harry, uh, Ozzy and Harry, you know, all these TV uh, family structures of patriarchy and so forth and so on. And the rest of us were just, just whatever, but we weren't a problem. And, and, you know, we used to have these hierarchies of normalcy, right, which were, that would capture all kinds of ethnic groups. So you could be Italian-American, and that would mean that you're higher status than a black person, but it would also mean that... Lower than something Yeah, yeah you were still yeah. culturally suspect. Yeah, right. You weren't properly Plus lost. a little too dark no, in no, some no, case. Yeah. Exactly, right. <laughs> we're talking about wedge politics, aren't we? And if you, if you want to put a wedge, you've got to find people to put it in between. And it seems to me that for American politicians to find groups that they can stick wedges in between and pit against one another. Is that my imagination? Um, well, I think when we talk about wedge politics, I think you could make an argument that wedge politics are very old. Um, but at least in modern American politics, let's say post-1960s, the original wedge politics really is the Southern strategy and Richard Nixon and what his advisors used to refer to as positive polarization. Uh, that they would deliberately come up with issues, law and order, for example, silent majority, that they knew would drive a wedge between the Democratic Party and its traditional constituencies uh, among what used to be called blue-collar ethnic voters. The politics of the Southern strategy, have, I think they've been a consistent theme in the Republican Party for decades now. We had an organization that we worked with in Chicago, we the Black Panther Party, uh, called the Young Patriots. And most of them were, I mean, this is their hardcore, ridge-running hillbillies, you know, uh, tobacco chewing and the whole piece, you know, thinking that um, we'll call black people the N-word uh, in a minute without even thinking about Rand Martin Luther King out of, uh, out of the Chicago area and so forth and so on. But that group of people who are really poor, many of whom really um, also have a history uh, going south, farther south in, in the uh, Confederate Army and, and have a heritage piece with the Confederacy. And I often tell them that. I'm like, I don't know why you're waving the Confederate flag. It didn't do anything for you in the first place. You're still just as poor. Being white does not, take, does not translate into any money in the bank. But this is something that white people have bought into, thinking that somehow I can, you know, being white is, a, is better than at least not, I'm not black, even though I don't have any money and so forth. But the point is we, we were able to get the... Um, uh, an organization together called the Young Patriots. And they actually, many of them were running around with a Confederate flag on the back of their jackets and they didn't see any conflict uh, in these issues because there was a class relationship that they did understand. Now, a lot of other people, like black people, uh, if you're not living in the South, you see the Confederate flag is a terrible thing. And we get hung up on that cultural piece and don't recognize that there is a class relationship. So we were able to to hone in on that economic piece and say we all were having a problem with Chicago landlords and we actually organized around that. We don't even acknowledge we have poor white people in the United States. Um, we, 
we call everybody the middle, everybody squeezed into this uh, euphemistic or, you know, amorphous uh, a middle class. But the bottom line is there are really poor white people um, who have been ignored in many ways. And then, you know, the level of the uh, working industrial worker has been ignored. And I think that we, we should have gotten back to that. We who are on the left should have, uh, should have recognized what are we going to do with this question of, of class relationships. The Southern strategy was made possible by Lyndon Johnson. If Johnson had not signed the Voting Rights Act, if he had not attempted to desegregate, the Democrats would have kept the South. And Nixon realized that this was an angry white constituency that he could appeal to because the Democratic Party had taken a stand for civil rights, and he did. Nixon figured out that for Republicans to continue to be viable, they have to peel off all the Southern whites. Um, white people who are not okay with black people being equal citizens or okay with women being equal citizens. And critical to doing that was, they thought, appealing to white working class, blue collar voters, who socially, they believed, were more conservative and culturally were more conservative and were quite racially intolerant. And so the Law and Order campaign of 1968, the, the highlighting of the chaos in the streets, um, the highlighting of the degree to which uh, there was just a breakdown of authority in, in America. All of those things, I think, were fundamental to the kinds of appeals that Nixon and his strategists were fashioning in 1968. Law and order meant more than uh, let's just have the laws enforced. It meant let's have a more orderly society, a society in which um, there are not threats to property, in which uh, uh, young men wear their hair shorter, in which women wear skirts, in which um, people have sex only once they're married. Those white working class people began to think about voting for conservative Republicans. Uh, like a guy named George Wallace, who never actually became a Republican, but he ran for president in 1968 on an independent party ticket in which he said, white working class people ought to control this country. In effect, he was saying, he wouldn't say white, but you know, he'd say, they're tough. You know, they're not gonna give up. They're not gonna give in to any of this, uh, this chaos. And, and that was a, a popular opinion among a lot of Americans, even those who didn't vote for Wallace. Uh, but a lot of those who voted for Richard Nixon in 1968 felt the same way. George Wallace had replicated Barry Goldwater's success in the Deep South, proving that race could still drive politics in the Southern states. Richard Nixon's appeal to a conservative white electorate would see him win the 1968 presidential election and confirm Republican electoral strategy, vocal support for a so-called silent majority paid dividends. We're now 48% of the population in the city where I come from. In 1968, a divided United States was struggling to find reconciliation in a post-civil rights era. Richard Nixon had won the support of that silent majority of conservative white Americans to regain the presidency for a resurgent Republican Party. The outcome of the 1968 election demonstrated quite clearly that the Republicans' hunch that there was a silent majority out there um, was correct, that most people did not share the uh, politics of the pro-civil rights liberal Democratic Party that was emerging in the 1960s. With every gain made by marginalized sections of the American public, the American establishment, both government and business, sought redress to keep the status quo and keep the people in their place. In a 1971 memo written for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce by lawyer Lewis Powell, the business elite moved to take back some of the ground ceded to the American people. Lewis Powell wrote a memo in which he essentially said, U.S. business is losing a war for the soul of America. 
We are losing the campuses. We are losing the younger generations. They no longer hold business in esteem, as has always historically been the case in the United States. They now see business as a force for evil in American society. They want to rein it in. So business began organizing and uh, that union busting was one of the things that they attempted to do. They also began a long, uh, you know, what we might think of as a propaganda war um, in which they tried to convince people that um, giving more to the wealthy and giving more to business would be good for everybody. He talks about corporate money founding being put into massive right-wing think tanks like the Heritage Foundation. He talks about corporate money being used in campaigns. And that blueprint w was one that was adopted. And it was adopted in the end by both of the parties. You get think tanks funded by people like the Koch brothers, like the Cato Foundation, people who believe that if the free enterprise system as they define it is going to survive, they're gonna have to uh, fund lobbyists, uh, think tanks, writers who are going to defend it. Richard Nixon would reward Lewis Powell with a seat on an increasingly conservative U.S. Supreme Court. Lewis Powell is first and foremost a very great American. But when the president was found to have lied about a break-in at the Democratic Party headquarters in Washington, D.C., no court and no friends could save Nixon's presidency from ending in disgrace. I have fought for what I believe in. Sometimes I have succeeded, and sometimes I have failed. His time in office and the scandal-scarred years that followed would widen the rifts between the splintered American people and the established American authority. 200 years after its birth, the United States was still struggling to come to terms with who and what it wanted to be. In the 1970s, I think that was up for grabs, that sort of contest, if you will, between the, the, the forces demanding accountability and the forces determined to sort of put that genie back in the bottle. People didn't trust the federal government anymore to do the right thing, which they had up until the late 1960s, even the early 1970s. And that's very important because liberals in this United States depend on people having faith that the federal government can solve some problems. And if Americans don't have that faith, that helps conservatives. Now from the White House, the President of the United States. The liberal administration of President Jimmy Carter had appointed a record number of women and minorities to government while struggling to deal with economic downturns and failures of foreign policy. It is a crisis of confidence. In the 1980 presidential election campaign, perceived liberal excesses and weakness would once again fuel resentment, expose America's stubborn divisions, and present conservatives with a new opportunity. It would be seized with both hands by the Republican candidate, Ronald Reagan. Reagan represented the reorganization of the Republican Party uh, around um, a new coalition which um, ca starts capturing white workers uh, for the Republican Party. Um, and so you have this, this alliance of um, white workers um, alongside business elites um, and social conservatives. He's also playing to some themes that Richard Nixon and the Southern strategy uh, had popularized a few years earlier. Um, including the racial strategies of the Nixon era. Uh, and so his first stop after winning the nomination, the Republican nomination in 1980, is he goes to the Neshoba County Fair in Mississippi, um, and he gives, a, he, he gives a long speech. And in the midst of that speech, uh, he expresses his support for states' rights. We made a point of going to a town where uh, there had been a trial back in 1964 of some sheriffs uh, who were also Klansmen uh, who had killed some civil rights workers to basically say he was for states' rights. He didn't explicitly say 
I'm against civil rights. You couldn't do that anymore in 1980 America. States' rights was a coded overture to self-determined policies for Southern whites. Overt references to race may have been unacceptable in a post-civil rights America, but one young strategist in the Reagan camp would later recall how racial politics did not necessarily need racial references. You start out in 1954 by saying by 1968, you can't say that hurts your backfire, so you say stuff like uh, force busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes, and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. Because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut taxes is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing, and a hell of a lot more abstract than what you're talking about is the success of introducing racially coded appeals into American politics, that the government works for certain people, those other people, and it doesn't work for you. That interview that Atwater gave is kind of a Rosetta Stone for modern American politics. I am. You place your left hand on the bed. It was a strategy that worked. But I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Once in office, President Reagan set about the task of bolstering a corporate elite with tax cuts for the rich, reducing government spending, and making lavish wealth the new American dream. By lowering the rates, we will encourage the entrepreneurial spirit of the work ethic by letting people keep more of what they earn. It was very effective advertising and promises that the new neoliberal order would benefit everybody. And at that point, people didn't realize they were being had. Everybody drank the Kool-Aid. Everybody, and to some, it, it became like all reigning ideologies inevitable. Reagan really initiated, I would say, a kind of ideological war and a series of policies that would subsequently be built upon to create a historic level of inequality in American society. The voodoo economics of uh, supply-side economics, the idea that you could cut these taxes and you'd end up with more revenues, that's, it's just fraud. Reagan's comment in 1980 was, government isn't the answer, government is the problem. Arthur Laffer was one of President Reagan's economic advisors and among the architects of the theory called supply-side economics. It would form the basis of the president's fiscal policies, later to be known as Reaganomics. He cut the taxes. Uh, he didn't cut them by 30%, as everyone says he did. He moved the brackets out. Uh, the highest rate still stayed at 50%. Now he got rid of the 70% down to 50. We had growth rates in there, seven, eight, nine percent for years. We had this huge boom. Policies were put in place in the Reagan era to strip the middle class of the structures that they need in order to remain middle class. The elites figured out how to claw back that little bit of territory that these outsiders in the middle class had managed to get their hands on in, in the 70s. And that means capitalists get the profit, workers don't. <laughs> um, rich communities get the benefits, not poor communities. Um, that uh, economic inclusion is no longer a desirable goal for American society. We expect of you what we expect of ourselves and our own loved ones that you will do your share in taking responsibility for your life and for the lives of the children you bring into this world. The Reagan administration's policies would cut public expenditure on social programs and spend on building prisons. Millions of people are, are kicked off the welfare rolls during the Reagan administration. The investment in social welfare programs is, is almost gone. There's really this sense that there is nothing that can be done to solve the problem of black urban crime except for incarceration. The prison industrial complex really took off um, post Reagan, building prison structures to incarcerate more and more Americans, especially males of color. 
became monetized by private industry. And what happened then is this cycle of uh, lobbyists for the prison industry would push for laws that would make it easier to lock up more and more and more poor people. What happens is that these prisons are located in rural areas. Most of the people who are in the prisons are from urban areas. And rural areas in the United States tend to be white and urban areas and many states tend to be Latino and, and African American where uh, Americans of color live. So this ends up benefiting these rural communities at the direct expense of urban communities. President Reagan shifted U.S. ideology further to the right by attacking labor unions and pushing market deregulation. You ain't seen nothing yet. Republicans had shown Washington that this new conservatism was the only game in town. Thank you all very much. And after 12 years in the political wilderness, the Democrats would now follow the Republican lead. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. Clinton came from the right wing of the Democratic Party, a group called the Democratic Leadership Council. And their idea was that the Democratic Party had to move to the right, that it had gone much too far to the left. To radical change based on common sense and traditional values, that, that's what we can, can win with. Clinton introduces new uh, federal death penalty statutes, and by all these means communicates with certain elements of the electorate that for 20 years had been largely alienated from the Democratic Party. So basically every president from Nixon to Clinton uh, write crime policies to signal their loyalty to the values of white middle America. Prisons became a mechanism by which mostly rural whites could get jobs with benefits. Poor black and brown people whose bodies were worth nothing on the streets of deindustrialized cities could be placed in cages and generate 40 or $50,000 a year. You have more police on the street to arrest more people. You have harsher sentences um, for, for crimes that 10 years prior would, you wouldn't end up in prison for 10 to 15 years for. And then you had the expansion of the prison system. The private prison uh, organization seized on that. They thought, oh, we got guaranteed income. Bill Clinton was taking the Democratic Party, shifting it to the right, trying to overlap into some of that territory that the Republicans had traditionally held, not just in the South, but largely in the South as well. So pandering, choose your poison, choose your era. He was the bubble president, um, right? That's what we called him, right? He was the guy that working class people could relate to. So we've never dropped that. Democrats were playing, they decided that the only way that they were gonna beat the Southern strategy was by getting Southern governors who were Democrat to run for president. And that worked well with Bill Clinton. He got Arkansas. So then you take that aspect of the Bill Clinton legacy. Yeah. You marry that with the Southern strategy three strikes law. Yeah. And you've alienated a lot of people. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> Bill Clinton was very specific. Um, the way that he was able to get the, um, the uh, omnibus crime bill passed, the three strike amendment to the omnibus crime bill in 1994, which, was, uh, which is commonly called the Three Strikes Crime Bill, um, was he sold it uh, first to black people uh, with the idea that, and made a speech in 1993 at the same, in the same uh, pulpit where Dr. Martin Luther King gave his last great speech and said to the people there, look, you know, white people aren't killing you anymore. You're killing each other. You know, your problem is that when Mar if Martin Luther King were alive today, what would he say? Um, this is terrible, all this black on black crime all this uh, breakdown of the black family, all these uh, unwed black mothers. And white people are just jumping up and down, thrilled to hear that finally we can finally say, yes, we're sick of you, you're all criminals, you need to go to jail. And he pushed through the three strikes crime bill on the idea that um, we, it was time for us to take care of ourselves. And not one white liberal was jumping up and down, not one feminist group, nobody jumped up and down and said a mumbling word against the crime bill. There are two problems with the Clintons as far as black people go that I would guess. Um, um, the first is, is that they were racial dog whistlers. And actually you two are pointing out they weren't really dog whistlers. They were just downright playing a race card when Clinton was president. And it's not like Hillary floated above that discussion. 
their role in mass incarceration was not insignificant. It was significant. The Clintons were pretty big participants in that. And it's not just mass incarceration. Those crime bills empower police departments in a way that makes them unaccountable in cities. Municipalities don't control them anymore. They get federal funding. And I'll add to one thing that Elaine was saying, too. Liberals were very, very concerned with black people in poor Rust Belt towns for a long time, but they didn't treat it as, a, as an economic problem. They treated it as a problem with black culture. But what about all that stuff about Bill Clinton being referred to as America's first black president? Wasn't that shameful? And, and black people actually said it, people like Toni Morris and people with, that you thought had a little bit of sense and Chris Rock. I don't know whether it was his lips you know, or his hair texture and, you know, it's kind of curly, whether he played the saxophone or that he admitted to eating watermelon, as many Southerners do anyway, and fried chicken and barbecue. But in any case, by the time he was finished um, with the Three Strikes Crime Bill, we had probably more black people incarcerated uh, in the U.S. than in South Africa at the height of apartheid. And this culture has prevailed. Most people really believe there is something, must be something wrong with black people. And so Clinton really established a cultural norm that has, that has really spread in what I call a neoliberal agenda, which it really is, that government is no longer here to take care of you. You are on your own. We remember that crime bill because of incarceration, because of the sentencing guidelines and so on. But that wasn't the only thing in that bill. No. There were rollbacks of habeas corpus. It's the most fundamental right that citizens have that protects them from improper prosecution and incarceration by the state. Nobody complained. Nope. And there was fine. another big <laughs> aspect. This is the only country in the world that adjudicates children as adults, in the United States, that is. The entire juvenile yeah. justice system was dismantled. 100-year-old system was completely dismantled by Clinton. But didn't Bill Clinton also semi-declare war on the welfare state, which is coded language in America? He signed the bill in 1996 to end welfare as we know it, the welfare reform bill, which essentially sent what was a federal welfare guarantee back to the states. And actually, 10, 15 years later, that legislation really blew up in poor people's faces because once we had a financial crisis and the states were finding themselves in fiscal holes, they could no longer sustain those welfare programs that had devolved in the 1990s. Under so that was, you know, that was a time a ticking time bomb that went off in some ways a decade later. Um, and so he did that in the context of a re-election campaign in 1996 that he was clearly going to win anyway. Um, and so I think there is a kind of intellectual momentum. It's electoral calculation, but it's also it's ideological. Um, because it's not always necessary to win elections to do these things, but that becomes an embedded belief, I think, among Democratic Party elites that we can't be seen as too favorable or too close to black people. You know, we need to make sure that we keep our distance. But I would add to that that I do think the economy matters. Um, and I do think that the Clintons were the people who pushed free trade. They were the Democrats that stopped being New Deal Democrats. They pushed NAFTA. I was working as a labor organizer in the 90s when Clinton was president. It was a nightmare. The Clinton administration consciously decided to take corporate money and do corporate bidding and sell out that segment of the Democratic Party, the working class, the labor unions in particular, uh, which had once had a voice within the establishment. They were trying to do a lot of things which were very pro-business. So privatizing Social Security it was a big uh, boondoggle for Wall Street because the way it was going to be done was every worker would have an in, a private account and Wall Street would um, get fees on those accounts. So it was enormous, enormous taxpayer subsidy to Wall Street. Once they start getting corporate money, the Democrats and Republicans start to compete over who can rewrite the tax code to give corporations greater advantages. The logic of multinational corporations and interconnected economies left little room for local loyalties when it came to jobs and industries. In 1994, President Clinton, alongside the leaders of Canada and Mexico, signed into effect the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, would embody the Democratic Party's submission to free market economics and 
its consequences. You saw under NAFTA, literally, factories in Ohio being crated up and shipped to northern Mexico, and then from there to Vietnam and China and everywhere else. And at that point, the American dream becomes the American myth. It's unattainable. Primary manufacturing basically disappears from the American landscape. And that happens between 1973 and, say, 1999. A lot of Americans were very afraid about this and felt that NAFTA, in fact, was undermining the living standards, was, was accelerating the decline of American manufacturing. Stand up still. The reality for American workers was that they were losing their jobs due to globalization and the need to compete with foreign workers. NAFTA is as American as apple pie. Clinton definitely was the first left of center liberal president to sign on to that globalization push. We wrote NAFTA. We couldn't get it through. It took Clinton to get it through. God bless him for that. I just thought he was spectacular with NAFTA. He went against his own party, against the unions, and did the right thing. By the end of the 1990s, the American century was giving way to a new global era. A loss of jobs and security would be partnered by a growing loss of faith in the institutions entrusted with delivering the dream. Despite gains made by minority groups in search of equality and justice, the country remained conflicted by race and divided by economic disparity. And at the dawn of a new millennium, America was to suffer its greatest loss and face its greatest test. We will not forget the lessons of September the 11th. You invoke this constant fear. You declare a war that never ends. Change has come to America. Obama's voting record was one corporate giveaway after another. It's in the bank's DNA to run amok if you let him run amok. This is the rage of white people finally feeling the same kind of pain that black and poor people have been feeling. The American dream was pulling you along to a fantasy of wealth and contentment, where this is pulling you along to a, a dream of apocalypse. We're going to make America great again. 